All right, camera, OBS, that is ready. Go. Hello everyone. As you may know, I am a freelance software engineer, usually taking projects for the creative industry. What usually happens is that people come to me to create a sort of visual appealing web creative component. I obviously do take bigger project inquiries, but that is mostly what's happening right now in my freelance clients. And in 2021, a Paris-based studio reached out to create exactly this, a good looking, interactive, 3D oriented web component. And obviously people do not show up randomly. I, uh, over the years, I posted what I do online. I show what I am capable of. And uh, as you can see, there is, uh, there is quite a little bit of a pattern here. Turns out I'm the balls guy. I think the last three WebGL projects that I have done were essentially somehow spherical looking online 3D balls. And this stuck to the rule. So here is the project. Uh, you can have access in the video description. But uh, here it is, essentially a 3D object in the middle. As you scroll, there are different uh, states. It is interactive when you move the mouse. Smooth looking uh, little animations. And it transitions to these things. I also did the disks and that 2D animation. But we are obviously here to talk about this ball right there. So this project was very interesting, challenging, taught me a bunch of little nifty things. And I made a little Twitter thread about it. By the way, shameless plug, follow me on Twitter. So I was saying this little Twitter thread that uh, did gain some speed. Uh, it was essentially just a, or oh, to like my own thing, no. It's essentially like a, a tiny case study of what happened like mathematically to create the ball. When I say it gained some tractions, it's, all things considered. Uh, those numbers might not be a lot for a lot of people, but to me, it was. And apparently you also enjoyed the last one-on-one -on -one video like this, where I directly talk to you about a project that I have done. And so this is the goal of this video, showing you and reverse engineer how I make this component, how I keep communication with my client, and maybe give you nifty little tricks along the way. And again, in this industry, there are 20,000 ways to skin a cat. And uh, maybe this is not the best one. And some people, again, with a gigantic god complex can insert in the description what I did wrong or how I could do it better. So let's get started. So first of all, everything comes with a brief, right? So what did the client want? I cannot show you the Figma for obvious reasons, but essentially uh, what you see right there is what I had in front of me. They just said, hey, who would like a component that is interactive, smooth, great looking, and that just like stands out a little bit from the rest. This is very vague, but they wanted something spherical, smooth, plasticky looking, and they essentially said like, make it interesting. And they left me a bunch of options. Like essentially I could do whatever I wanted with it. So this is always nice. They also said that they wanted multiple states around the ball. Like when you go on the website and if you just scroll, don't do anything else, you see that like you have this first blob, and then like it comes this other shape and then another one before it disappears into oblivion into the disks. And again, we're not gonna talk about the disk today. We're just gonna talk about the ball because it's already a big thing. So for 3D projects like this, or at least for me, it always starts with some research. For the moment, I never had one client coming to me and I just like get started on the project and it is very straightforward about what you need to do. Because like, as you can imagine, these types of animation, you are not gonna do them in a Figma, right? So it is my job to do some research about what can I do? What is the scope of the project? How I can realize my different wants? And also maybe push what I already know a little bit forward. So first of all, shading. When I saw the Figma and uh, I realized that this ball would like not move, I was like, what would be the best way to have something that works with colors that has like a pretty, how can I say that, like milky look to it, why not looking too much like real time 3D? And so with that, it was pretty obvious that I was gonna use matcaps for shading. Uh, so yeah, here are the matcaps that I rendered uh, with Blender by this, like this was my scene and I uh, did have a bunch of different materials that I wanted to show to the client. Every single thing that is 3D right now on this project were done using was shaded using matcaps. It is a pretty classic thing to use, I guess, in WebGL nowadays, because like, it's very, very cheap in terms of performances. It's so it's always a great look. Like it, the, the day I discovered uh, matcaps, it, it felt like a, like cheating, essentially. I'm like, how can this look this good? So essentially, you render about an image that at the end looks like this, like one of these spheres. And essentially, you have a, I need a good example right now, okay. And essentially you have an, uh, a 3D object that is in front of the camera right now, you are the camera. And essentially the normal of that 
polygon according to the position and orientation of the camera. Some maths gets involved and it calculates a place to sample the color on the madcap. And so this is how you can obtain pre-calculated lights with pretty, pretty good results. The only thing is that you cannot have an object that moves too much, otherwise it's gonna obviously give it away. Maybe I could have done everything directly into the shader because like it's not that much involved in terms of uh, lights and stuff like that. But it was just so easy and it just worked way too good at the end and the client was also very happy. So I stuck to it. So yeah, I had my solution for shading. Now what about interactivity? What did I want to do with this pretty simple ball? So a first big classic is when you move around, like you have this camera parallax. This is one of the oldest 3JS trick in the book. And in my opinion, if you don't have that, why even have a 3JS scene? Like if this didn't move when my uh, cursor moved around, it would have just felt like a simple, 3D rendered animation that just moves on the scroll. And this is not the case, this is real time 3D, so this is important. How it works, very simple, you have an object right there, I'm gonna move the camera right now, and essentially on the mouse move, the camera is just gonna move and staying put around the object. You add a pretty simple easing math function with that, and you have this pretty smooth animation. And once you realize that, you can see how often it is displayed on websites, because again, it works, and it's pretty nice to look at. So that was the first interaction. The second one was this mouse bump. When you interact with the sphere in the middle, a little piece gets extracted and elongated. I am pretty happy about this one and this is where I already learn a little bit of stuff. On my Twitter thread somewhere, yeah, I explain a little bit about how that worked. You have this thing in the middle, you calculate where the mouse position is and you shoot a ray directly into that. And that ray, when it goes through the ball, it gives you a position or where that is. And essentially I took that and inside the shader, I just take the distance of every pixels according to my mouse. And essentially just taking that distance with a few simple math, I can display a circle that you can see right there. Obviously you add a little bit more smoothing to make it like a little bit smooth. You also add an easing function so that when you move the mouse, it doesn't directly follow it so that it's not too sharp. It slowly moves around and like, yeah, you have this little effect. But as you can see right now, this is done in the fragment shader. This is just for the color. So all of that information, I just pass it inside the vertex shader and I essentially multiply that value to the position of the vertex. So I just said a bunch of buzzwords right now, a bunch of math thing. Uh, this is not a tutorial. Again, like this is a pretty basic one-on-one -on -one talk about how that works. Uh, I could do bigger videos and like go into the great details about the shader, but like not a lot of people are gonna be interested. And again, we are just here to see somehow how I made this work. So yeah, essentially that pretty easy and it worked and I liked it. Um, oh yeah, there you go. This was the second example where like I actually extrude the ball. So yeah, that was the second interaction. Next, how did I work with the states? So essentially, as I said, when you scroll, you have those multiple steps with the ball. I did that pretty easily. So I first created each shaders for multiple states. So like those are pretty simple math functions. Like this one, for example, displayed right there. It's just a little bit of noise, just like a wave, a sign function to make that work. Um, the other ones is just pure noise, I guess. Yeah, with that a little bit of signs. And it's just a bunch of like plugging random values in a shader and see what happens. Here is the here is the shader how it works. Like, yeah, as you can see, there's a bunch of uniforms that we don't need right now, but like, um, there you go. Yeah, I call them frames. Each of these frames represent each of the steps. And so if you go to the functions of those, there you go. This is just a bunch of random math. You see some uh, radians that I calculated, some sine function, a bit of remap, and you get the displacement and, and, and this and that, whatever. Just like goof around with math and number and you're gonna have pretty convincing uh, different states. And to make them go smoothly together, I just use a good old mix function. So the mix function, what does it do? It uh, takes two floats or like whatever dimension you want. So like here, those are like threes and it just transitions between the two compared to another number that is right there. And this number is obviously getting back from the progress bar, which is the scroll wheel. So yeah, here is how the states are gathered. Bunch of math function, plug them into a mix, as you progress, you change the mixing functions and this is just the output of your vertex. Now we enter the interesting part. 
This is where I think I learned the most. So in the shader, in the first shader that is sent to the GPU, so you obviously pass a bunch of information. You pass the position of the different vertices, the relation between each other to create polygons, the UVs, that kind of good stuff, and also particularly the normals of the different vertices and polygons. And so why is that important? Well, since I displace a bunch of these vertices with that mouse bound thingy and also like the mathematical function we just talked about, if I don't recalculate the normals, it's essentially gonna stay uh, shaded the way it was at the beginning and everything would look essentially false. Imagine, this is the object that I pass to the camera. And as you remember, when I pass it in this position, the normal is right there. And if in my vertex shader I decide to change its position, uh, the normal is gonna stay oriented like that, where it was in the beginning. So I need to find a way to make that also follow the particular displacement. And to do this, there is this amazing article, or like more like forum post, about calculating vertex normals after displacement in the vertex shader. This is gold. I come back to this article a lot. Like it's, it's, just, it's just that good. So essentially in this article, like it explains you very, very quickly how to do exactly this calculation in the vertex shader, but also gives you uh, like different examples of where he found the different ways of how to do this. So like those are the different examples. And also this fantastic math articles about how this is all done. And this, if you have time, is insanely interesting. During my robotics engineering studies, we did a lot of robotics vision. This course was all about pixel manipulation with an image entry. And this reminded me a lot about that. So yeah, if you have time, and if you are a little bit about math, read this. This is amazing. Uh, oh, by the way, this article, I'm gonna obviously put it in the description, but also it is in my Twitter thread. So yeah, recomputing normals in the vertex shader, this was the thing that I learned the most from in this project, which is pretty amazing. I talked about all of this. Uh, some of you maybe already clicked off the video. Uh, how do I make all of that work with a studio who is not into 3D? Because like we can have a meeting and I told them like, yeah, I've been doing all of these research for the past two weeks, but I don't have nothing for you yet. Obviously it's like, it's not the best. You could have lied. They, they don't know shit about that. My favorite way of working is keep everything like everything, everything, every research, whatever, and arrange them so that the client can see what you've been doing. So for example, like me, I have this old folder where like I have all of my different tests that you can see. This was since the beginning. And all of those, I obviously push them to an online repo that is right there and put them very, very easily on a Netlify link. So that when I am working on something and I would like to show it to the client, I can essentially just send a very simple link and say like, hey, this is what I've been doing. What do you think so far? And like they can redirect me where they would like to go. This type of development, it's not really straightforward. When you do basic front-end engineering, you receive a mockup, you need to integrate it and like you know what you want at the end. These things, you have a lot of constraints and it is very difficult to communicate orally a vision about what would you like to have on the website. So send as many data as you can to your client so that he can relocate you if you're not on the right track. And if you are, well, kudos to you. So that's my first tip. The second one, use GUIs or GUIs, however you would like to call it. For example, use as many GUI variable as you can so that the client can play with it. For example, like, how can a client communicate to me like, yeah, the ball, you would like it more spiky, but less smooth as well as more 60 FPS. You know what I mean? 90% of the time, you don't know what they mean because like they use a particular vocabulary that you don't get you as the tech guy. Every single variable that you pass to the shader or whatever, put them in a GUI and let the client play with it. So if for example, like there, like I had the, the frequency, the amplitude, and the client can play with everything based with that. And they are also, most of the time pretty happy with it because like, first of all, it is fun to play with. It is their thing that they are paying for. And also it is the best way to communicate very, very easily. So as you can see, those are the different functions that I talked about, the different states. And I created, and I created this GUI so that the client can himself play around with the different variables. And once he's happy with his own result, he just passed them back to me. And we don't even have to have like a one-on-one a -on -one peer coding meeting and be like, yeah, like try 1.7 here, 1.7 there. They have everything here. 
and they're going to be pretty happy about that and they're going to give you back your results and it's going to be exactly what they wanted on their website which is pretty cool oh yeah also like the thing that is sometimes very difficult to make understand to clients is the balance between smoothness of the actual app and what you can achieve visually speaking. So this is really related to the video gaming industry. Uh, you cannot add on the website a graphic settings, like, a, like I don't know, like an, uh, an ultra or whatever. You cannot do that. You need something that works with the scope you want. The way I deal with that usually, I let the client, like in my GUI, I let the client select the number of maximum polygons he would like on his particular scene. And so he can do everything he wants to try it on different machines. And I just be like, hey, this in front of you is what you have and what you will get. I think you can always optimize what you are working on. Like always, always, you can always like try to get a few more milliseconds on your render time, but it might not be the best way. Go as deep as you can with optimization. And once you're done, show the balance to the client and say like, hey, this is the minimum we can do. This is the maximum we can do in terms of smoothness and in terms of good lookingness of the actual piece. For the moment, I was pretty lucky to never face a client that is like disappointed in the end result. Uh, I guess because like I make clear from the beginning that yeah, this is this is not prevented things. This is real time. So don't expect a Pixar rendered animation live on your browser. But yeah, be clear about the fact that real time 3D will not be the same as prevented images. And I think this communication and being directly open about it is also what makes clients come back. Be very open and just teach them about these kind of things, because this is just also pretty interesting. So yeah, overall, this BizUp project was insanely interesting to develop. We didn't go into any details and I also didn't show about uh, the transition to the disk with that dissolve animation. I didn't talk about this uh, 2D animation as well. There are just so many things to talk about. Again, like it's uh, multiple weeks projects. It is gonna be very, very hard to put it everything in one single video right there. But overall, yeah, an amazing project. It was by far the smoothest uh, freelance experience I ever had, for sure. I feel insanely lucky to work on these things. And since that project, obviously other things came out that are unfortunately not yet on the web, but I feel insanely lucky to be able to do these things. I think that's it. Do not hesitate to leave a follow, ask any questions, follow me on different social media. Oh, and I'm also obviously open for freelance right now. I'm always happy to discover new creative people and I don't know, reach out, have a talk. All right, I think that's it for me. That was fun. Thank you for sticking until the end. And uh, apart from that, I see you soon on the internet. Bye-bye.